Well, hello, this is Eric Topol, and uh, for this uh, edition of Ground Truth, I'm so delighted to have with me uh, Professor Tony weiss Corey of Stanford, distinguished professor at Stanford, and directs the uh, Knight Initiative for Brain Resilience. So welcome, Tony. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Eric. Well, I've been following your career and your work for decades, I have to say, and uh, what you just published uh, a couple of weeks ago in Nature, the cover paper about internal organs, uh, it blew me away. I mean, it's built on a foundation of extraordinary work. Um, I thought we could start with that because to me, that's really a breakthrough uh, in that when we think of aging and how to gauge a person's aging, things like the Horvath clock of methylation or telomeres are kind of um, not at all specific to any part of the body, just overall. But you published an extraordinary work about plasma proteins for 11 organs that uh, predicted the outcome of things like heart failure and Alzheimer's. So maybe you could tell us about this seems to be a big deal to me. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, I'm, I'm honored. Um, really, you know, I think if you work on this stuff, especially for several years, it feels sort of obvious to do it. Um, but I think, you know, it is in a way, it is pretty simple. So what we, what we argued is that the thousands of proteins that, you know, are present in our blood, they must originate from somewhere. Now, a lot of proteins are, you know, produced by cells throughout the body. But some proteins are very specifically produced, for example, only in the brain or only in the liver or only in the heart because they have specialized functions. And we have, you know, been taking advantage of that in clinical medicine when, where you measure often, you know, one of these proteins to sort of diagnose pathology in a tissue. But we took this just a level further and said, well, let's just find out of thousands of proteins that we can measure, assign them to specific organs and tissues, and then see whether they change with age. And many of them turn out to change. We found, you know, about 1,500 proteins or so in the study that we did, although that number can grow dramatically if we, you know, keep improving our technologies or techniques to measure them. And many of them come from the brain or from other tissues. And because they change with age, they tell us something about the aging of that organ. And as others have shown in the field, including Steve Horvath, is that that prediction of the age, if it doesn't really match exactly your actual age, contains information about the state, the physiological state, or the risk to develop organ-specific disease. Right, and you found that about one in five people had evidence of accelerated aging of, of one organ, uh, which, of course, is really starting to nail down the ability to detect aging, you know, to relocalize it. And um, what strikes me, Tony, is that now, because we're, we're seem at the cusp of advancing in the science of aging, a field that you have done so much to, to propel forward. And uh, one of the issues has been, well, how are we going to prove it? We can't wait for 20 years to show that whatever intervention led to promotion of healthy aging. But when you have a marker like this of organ specificity, it seems like the chances of being able to show that intervention makes a difference is enhanced. Would you say so? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's one of the most exciting aspects of this, that we can now start looking at interventions, whether they are, you know, a specific interventions that tries to target the aging process or, you know, just that a drug, let's say a cholesterol lowering drug or um, blood pressure lowering drug, does that have a beneficial effect on the heart, for example, um, on the kidney or, you know, um, and you can also start thinking of lifestyle interventions, whether they actually have an effect, right? If you started exercising 
you collect your blood before and then a year after you have an exercise regimen, does that actually change the the, the age that we can measure with these uh, different clocks? Right. Well, I mean, it's really a striking advance in biomarker of aging. So that gets me to work you've done well over 10 years, which is that you could identify uh, that given young blood, first, of course, in mice, and then later uh, verified in people, could improve cognitive function um, and in, in older, uh, uh, whether it's experimental models or, or people. Uh, so what are your thoughts about that? Is that if you, that's something you've been ruminating on for, for many years? And I, I, I'm sure there are places around the world that are trying to do this sort of thing. What, what do you think of that potential? Yeah, so, and, and they're really, this recent observation or study really came out of, you know, that finding that young blood can change the age of different organs. And, you know, we, we were not the first to show this. We showed it for the brain, but Tom Rando, who studied muscle stem cell aging, showed this, you know, a few years earlier in the muscle. And then we worked with with Tom um, to explore this for the brain. But it shows sort of that this, you know, the composition of the blood um, is really not just reflecting the age of organs and tissues, but it actually also affects them. It directs them in a way. And so you can speculate that, you know, if if you had an, an organ that shows accelerated aging, because some of the factors end up in the blood, they might actually induce aging in other tissues and so promote the aging process. And, and people in the field have also shown that this is true for specific cells. We call them senescent cells. So these are a specific type of cell that seem to somehow stop dividing and, and assume the state that releases inflammatory factors. These cells too, they seem to almost infect the neighborhood where they live in with an age-promoting sort of um, uh, secretome, we call it. So they release factors that seem to promote aging locally, but potentially across the organism. And interfering in that could potentially have rejuvenating effects. And so that brings us back to this observation that Young blood could potentially rejuvenate organs. We know old blood can accelerate it, in at least in mice, right? So, could we neutralize the age-promoting factors in people, and could we, you know, deliver sort of the rejuvenating factors? Now, what's been frustrating for me is that it has been incredibly challenging to identify the key factors. Um, and I think we became to realize as a field that there's not one factor. There's not one magic factor that will keep us young or keep our organs young. But rather, different cells and different organs in our body seem to respond in different ways, actually, to this young blood. We can show this with molecular tools. We can show that every cell actually responds. So if you take a mouse, an old mouse, and you give it young blood, every cell in that mouse shows a transcriptional response to the young blood. Um, but some of them, you know, may regenerate mitochondria and others activate other pathways. We see that stem cells respond particularly well, uh, uh, the stem cells of the immune system, hematopoietic stem cells, um, while other cells show less of a response. And that, to me, suggests that they respond to different factors in the young blood. And that, you know, they have very specific um, receptors, probably, that recognize some of these beneficial factors and then respond in a specific way. So what we need to figure out, I think, as a field, to translate this, really, to the clinic is, what are the key factors? And will it be possible to make a cocktail that sort of mimics nature's, you know, elixir, if you will? Um, and, uh, you know, 
I, I said this before, it's it's almost like the the fountain of youth is within us, but it just dries out as we get older. And, um, you know, if we could figure out what are the key factors uh, that, that make up this fountain, we could potentially, you know, either um, as a treatment, you know, deliver it again or reactivate that fountain so that the body produces these factors again. Well, you know, that's something that years ago I was very skeptical about. And because of your work and others in the field, I've come a long way thinking that we're on the cusp of really identifying ways to truly promote healthy aging. Uh, and so this is really, you know, extraordinary time in our lives. I wonder, you, you of course mentioned two critical paths that have been identified, the senescent cells, removing them or uh, the infusion of young plasma, young blood. And would you say it's, it's too simplistic to reduce this to decreasing inflammation? Is that really the theme here, or is it much more involved than that? I think inflammation has a big part in that. But, you know, inflammation is such a broad term and such an ill-defined term yeah, yeah. that um, you, yeah, I can say yes to your question, and I'm probably not going to be wrong. Um, but if we really want to know, you know, which which you know molecular pathways in the inflammatory cascade are key to this, uh, you know, detrimental process that ex- seems to accelerate aging. Um, I think we have to to work a bit harder and and really define what we're saying. You can't just have thousands of of proteins or genes that have something to do with immune and inflammatory processes called inflammation. Then yes, everything is inflammation. But I think we have to more be more precise, otherwise you can't really target it. Having said that, you know, if we use sort of the conventional tools that biologists use, these pathway analyses, if we give young plasma to an, or, an aged organism, then the top pathway or one of the top pa- pathways in almost every cell is inflammation, suggesting that we reduce the inflammatory process. But again, it's, it's in a very broad sense. And I, I want to know more what, what, what we're finding. In fact, you know, one of our first observations when Saul Vileda was in my lab and did these first parabiosis studies to look at factors that might promote um, brain aging, he identified beta-2 microglobulin and eotaxin. Eotaxin is a chemokine that is involved in a lot of, you know, sort of uh, inflammatory uh, responses and has actually recently, more recently again, been implicated by Michel Mange here at Stanford to be a mediator of, you know, the chemo brain, as people call it, um, at least in animal models. And we showed that it's part of the age plasma that causes sort of a, um, an acute impairment of cognitive function in mice. So that would be an example of a bad factor. And that is part of an inflammatory cascade. But we want to know what exactly is it. Um, we tried a small molecule uh, that targets the receptor, one of the main receptors for this chemokine, but unfortunately in humans. But unfortunately, that um, compound had some side effects on the liver, and we never got to really test the question: Is this, you know, potentially important? It's, it's one of the challenges of, um, you know, drug development that you often don't get to test your questions because the drug has side effects that don't allow you to do that. Well, speaking of drugs out there, this past week, there was a very provocative paper from um, uh, Daniel Drucker, University of Toronto, on the GLP-1 effects on brain inflammation. Uh, And uh, interestingly, with you may have seen it, but with mice that were either knocked out of GLP-1 for their blood cells or their brain, um, it was clear that inflammation reduction with these drugs, and they tested several different GLP-1 uh, agonists, uh, worked through the brain, which was really fascinating. And I wonder, 
Uh, of course, these drugs are now, you know, the craze for anti-obesity. But do you see something like that, this uh, this peptide um, agonist, as a potential way to to uh, achieve some of the effects that you've been working on for a long time? Yeah, I, I think this is extremely fascinating. Um, I mean, these drugs, um, we don't understand them exactly what they're doing. Uh, as you know, for many drugs, but it, it's really amazing the effects that you see. And, you know, I'm very hopeful there's a large phase three trial in Alzheimer's disease uh, ongoing. Um, so, and the phase two looked very positive, uh, very promising. So, you know, it, it is really possible that, um, th- that there, that there are key pathways that, are responsible for you know cognitive decline and uh, cognitive impairment and that uh, inflammation is a is a key aspect of that. Again, inflammation in a broad term, we need to define it. But it could be that it goes through, you know, um, through these uh, GLIP receptors and um, yeah, and yeah, that well, is a, might be a, some regulator of a broader process. But, you know, it, you, we see, for example, with, with aging, just with normal aging, you get um, activation of um, inflammatory pathways in the brain vasculature. And young plasma reduces these, these changes uh, acutely. And maybe this is, you know, all part of a um, just dampening that inflammation gives you some additional... Um, you know, brain power, if you will, lack of a better word. Um, and and that much of, you know, at least the early stages of cognitive impairment that lead to Alzheimer's disease are relatively transient and are more like a fog, like we say, you know, the chemo fog, the chemo brain or brain fog but that, you know, with COVID that you also commented on um, very prominently, that that suggests that it's not a structural damage early on, but it, that it might be some soluble factors that would go a long way if you could just suppress them. Right, right. Well, it's really fascinating to see, and I'm glad you mentioned the phase three trial in Alzheimer's for this one class, because I think that's expected uh, in 2025 to read out. and That'll be really important. But uh, I wanted to ask you, because now there's many shots on goal to change the natural arc of aging and all these companies like Altos and Unity and Calico. And I mean, there's so many of them, I can't even keep track. Um, they're all taking different strategies. I, I have to think because they need to have their own intellectual property. What, what do you see as the alluring ways that we're going to be able to modulate this process? That's a very tough question. Um, I, I think it's hard to predict, I would say, you know, like always in, in, in biology. First of all, uh, as you know, what we discussed earlier, it could be that a drug that tries to test a pathway, like, you know, one that Unity tried, has side effects and, you know, uh, you can't actually test um, your hypothesis. Uh, but... I think one of the key sort of um, aspects of of the aging process is is really that it's both it's global across the organism, but it's also very localized. And so it's possible that targeting the aging process will first show benefits um, in individual tissues. If we target you know the aging process in one particular tissue, that might show the first benefits. Um, But then again, it could be that if there is sort of a key inflammatory driver that, um, you know, is is to some extent responsible for overall aging of the organism, and you manage to target that and and slow it or block it, you may have an organism-wide effect. Mm. But I think we have to be we have to be realistic that, you know, this is going to be an incremental process, I think. So is there anything that you've seen that 
has grabbed you as having tremendous potential that is new? Uh, or is it really, you know, the things that have already been percolating that, that we know about? Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the clip one study, I've, I've been actually a, a bit involved in that. Um, I, I find this really fascinating. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, that I, I mean, spent... not in that study that got published, but in uh, sort of more on the cognitive side. Right, right. I thought that was especially welcome news because the drugs we have now for Alzheimer's seem to have you know some pretty serious side effects and somewhat low efficacy relative to the to the risk assessment. So this would be a, a drug that we know now as people have taken for years. That I, I did want to get back to you on uh, with you on the durability. So if you give young blood to an old person who has, let's say, mild cognitive impairment, will you see a durable uh, uh, impact or is it just a very short-lived one? I think some of the effects will be durable. And I'm saying that because of an experiment that James White and, and Vadim Gladyshev uh, did they use this parabiosis model where you suture a young and an old mouse together. They left these mice together for two months, I mean, it's, or three months, and then they separated them and let them live um, and looked at how long does an old mouse live that was paired with a young mouse for a few months compared to a, an old mouse that was paired with another old mouse. And they saw that there is clear extension of lifespan if the mouse was exposed to young blood. Now, this is in the context of, you know, two major surgeries, first suturing them together and then taking them apart. But, you know, I, I always note that when I present this experiment, but I also say uh, at the same time that this is the problem that a lot of older people have, right? They, when they have a surgery, they don't recover from it as well. And it's often the beginning of cognitive decline. If you ask families, you know, when did it start? Oh, they had heart surgery, or they fell and had, you know, um, had uh, hip surgery, or uh, something like that, or a major infection, um, a zoster, or something like that. That is often the trigger where the it's almost like, you know, the organism is hanging in there, and is still functioning. And then there is an injury and it collapses. Um, and so, you know, what's remarkable with the rejuvenating intervention with, with parabiosis is that it seems to overcome this to a very significant e event. And they also showed, you know, with many other tools, including with the um, Horvat clock, that tissues are actually getting younger um, through this process. We have also found that, you know, stem cells um, are rejuvenated for a long period of time if you treat with young plasma infusions in mice. And so I'm, I'm hopeful that some of the effects are going to be long lasting. But, you know, practically, you would probably still treat people on a regular basis, right? Uh, like we do with all drugs, but maybe you would do an infusion every three months or every six months. And, you know, we're still trying with um, uh, a company that I, st that, that I started, um, Alcahest, to, you know, convince people to, to do a phase three clinical trial and, and, and see how far we can push this. Well, it'd be really interesting to see you get that done. Um, then going back to the senescent cells, which is another leading prospect, uh, it seems to be more difficult to get these cells out of the body. Uh, we know they're bad actors, but it isn't like we can, you know, uh, very selectively remove them. Uh, but what are your thoughts about that approach? Yeah, I mean, it, I'm always really puzzled and amazed at the effects that people show with, you know, senescent cell removal in, in animal models, right? Um there is something really almost magical there that you remove these few cells and, you know, the body is doing much better. Um, so I think, you know, we, sh we should keep trying very hard to 
uh, translate this to humans. But it's possible that, again, there are there, there are very likely different types of senescent cells in different tissues. I mean, in the brain, you know, there are no rapidly dividing cells. So it's not the classic, you know, arrest of cell cycle, but it's probably more like an astrocyte type of cell that might mimic a senescent state. Um, but I think it will be, it will be, you know, very much organ specific and um, may require very specific interactions or a tar- a drug targets um, and, and drugs. Right. Well, then gets, gets, gets us back to kind of where we started um, before your, what I consider a landmark paper. Um, it would be difficult to be able to go to a regulatory body like the FDA and say, we show that this is affecting the aging process. And we show in, you know, three organs, five organs, whatever, the 11 organs you could track, we are reversing the aging process. I mean, you have that now as a extraordinary finding. Do you think that will help accelerate the field by having, uh, not having to have a whole body aging story with a, uh, with an epigenetic clock, but rather, you know, a much more pinpointing organs that can be helped, that they can be uh, promoting healthy aging. It seems to me this is where the, not only advancing the, the theories of how to do it, but the proof that you have done it, it seems like this is what you know, why I consider it such an extraordinary finding. I, I totally agree with you, but I'm a bit biased. <laughs> I, I, I think, you know, this is what we need. I mean, that's, this was always a criticism to me. And, you know, we're very good friends with, uh, with Steve Horvath and uh, Morgan Levine, um, who, you know, came up with, with these remarkable aging clocks can Raj, right and but my my question was always how can you get information about the whole body aging by looking at changes in blood cells or cheek cells right um that cannot contain information about how your pancreas ages or your heart ages at the high resolution it will correlate admittedly but it will not give you tissue specific information most likely um so you know going going more directly at mo- molecules that are derived from cells across the organism is of course you know going to be much more informative um we've just started to do this you know it's a concept um we are super excited about, you know, looking now at um, large data sets like the UK Biobank, which has got access through um, a collaboration to 50,000 individuals where we have 1,500 protein measurements with a different proteomic platform. And it seems most of the findings uh, replicate. So you see a similar... Um, you know, very strong risk for people who have older brains to develop dementia in the future. Um, and, you know, we still see these extreme organ agers that I find very puzzling. Yeah, no, it's, it's really striking. And the fact that you could replicate the best biomarker for the brain, um, the uh, Tau-181, uh, through these proteins uh, is, is exceptional. How much did machine learning AI help you in in deciphering this large data set of p- proteins? Was it really critical, or was it just a small uh, part? Oh, it's it's certainly. I mean, this is. I think you know the terminology. I'm not so clear, and I have to admit, you know, I'm not a computer scientist by any stretch. Um, but I think this is classic machine learning, um, statistical elements of learning, you know, um, how Rob Tipsharani described it. So we use still ENET, we use linear modeling in these, um, uh, in these models. Um, but I think it will become more sophisticated. Um, and I think AI will help us to bring this 
to a much higher level by by basically learning from the the relationship between proteins directly and then compare that in healthy people versus control similar to what Christina Theodoris recently did um, for gene expression at the single cell level. Um, I think we will see that, and we're trying this, and I'm sure others are trying this too at the protein level. Right, right. Well, but the no. current the current study uses really more traditional machine learning models um, that you know are sophisticated, but it's not you know I'm not sure we call this artificial intelligence. You sure? Well, I think, as you say, it can build on that and, you know, putting in yeah. transformer models to more data sets and where the future goes, yeah. you'll get even more precision uh, out- output. Well, you know, Absolutely. Tony, this, this has been a real joy. Um, I have to say uh, congratulations to you and your team for such Thank exceptional you. work. This has been a multi-decade um, you know, one layer of after another of building on the science of aging, particularly the brain aging. I've learned so much from you. And you. I have to say, the paper you just published, you and your group, got me excited. I mean, I really thought of all the things I've seen on aging, this was the one that really opens it up for, you know, all the other possible ways to, to claim it, you're, you're making a difference. You've got a way to, you have a metric that's emerging and so kudos to you, and uh, I know uh, this has got, you know, got to be, of course, that you probably just think, oh, it's just one more thing we've been doing, but <laughs> I, I'm so uh, duly impressed. Thank you so much. Thank you for the nice word. It means a lot. Well, keep up the great stuff because we're all, we're all depending on you so that we can uh, have a better uh, arc of our uh, healthy aging uh, process, and uh, we'll keep in touch. Thank you. Thanks so much.